Greetings everybody and today we're going to be taking a look at this integral, that's the integral from 0 to pi of e to the cosine of theta times sine of theta plus sine of theta d theta. So it looks like an absolute mess but if you've watched my previous video then this one shouldn't be too tricky to do. Um, so yeah this is actually an integral I found in one of my university archives for some complex analysis class a couple years ago I think. Um, but yeah figured I'd present this one because it has a bit of an unexpected answer in some sense which we'll find out at the very end of this video video. Um, but yeah, this one's not too bad to evaluate. Um, we'll just use the same techniques as we did in the previous video up to some extent. So yeah, the first thing I'm going to do is replace the sine function with the complex exponential because we have all this junk in here. Um, so to do that, we're going to recall Euler's formula. So recall that if we have e to the i times t, then that's just the cosine of t plus i times the sine of t. Now in the previous video, we took the real part of this complex exponential because we wanted to recover the cosine. However, here we want the sine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the imaginary part instead, and that is going to give us the sine function that we wanted. Okay, but we don't just want sine of t, we want sine with all this junk on the inside. So why not substitute t for that? So if we have the imaginary part, and let's plug this in, so this is e to the i theta plus i times the sine of theta, then this is going to give us the sine of theta plus sine of theta, like so, just as we wanted. Okay, so let's plug all of this back into our integral. So this is going to give us the integral from zero to pi of e to the cosine of theta. And then this sine is going to become the imaginary part of e to the i times theta plus i times the sine of theta and then integrated with respect to theta. Now you'll notice that we have this e to the cosine theta which is a real function so we can just drag and drop it into this imaginary part operator. So we have the integral from 0 to pi of the imaginary part of and now we can use some exponential properties to combine these two exponential functions together. So we're going to have e to the cosine of theta, and I'm going to write i to sine theta first. So we have i times the sine of theta. And then finally, we have this i times theta. And now you may notice that we have cosine plus i times the sine, so we can use Euler's formula once again. So this becomes, and another thing I'm going to do as well is I'm going to bring this imaginary part operator um, to the front of the integral because if you integrate the imaginary part that's the same thing as taking the imaginary part of the integral so we have the imaginary part integral from zero to pi of e and now that part we said that was e to the i theta so we have e inside of an e and then for this i times theta i'm going to split it off into its one little thing so it's going to become e to the i theta like so and then integrate with respect to theta okay so this looks a bit more promising than when we had initially because of this e to the i theta is actually the derivative of the inside of this exponential function. So what we can do is we can, for example, let um, z to be equal to e to the i theta. And then what are we going to get for dz? Well, that's just going to be i e to the i theta d theta. And now what do we want? We want just e to the i theta d theta. So let's just bring that i divided on both sides. So dz over i is what we have in here. Okay, so that's going to give us the imaginary part of the integral. Now we're going to worry about the bounds later on, but here we're going to have e to, this is a z, and then this e to the i theta d theta, that just becomes dz over i. So times dz and then divided by i like so. And how about the bounds over here? Well, notice what is the map? It's a complex exponential map, which means if we're on the interval from zero to pi, we're just going to map it to a semicircle of radius one. So if I draw a little picture here, where do we map to? Well, we map to this semicircle with a radius of exactly one traversed in the anti-clockwise direction. So we start at one, ends up at minus one, and I'm gonna call that contour gamma. So this is the integral over gamma, not quite a contour integral because we're not doing a closed loop, but it's just some path integral. Now here, what we can actually do, is instead of having to integrate along this path, this curvy path, what we can do is use some path deformation because notice what are we integrating? We're integrating e to the z and divided by i as well, but that thing is still entire. So it's holomorphic everywhere in the complex plane, which means if we have a path running between two points, it doesn't really matter 
how we get from one end point to the other, as long as we start at the same point and we end at the same point. Um, don't think I've proven that yet on this channel. It's not too tricky to do. Maybe I'll evaluate it this way, which will hopefully make it more clear. What I'm going to do is I'm going to construct another path running directly from minus one to one along the real axis and um, to kind of complete the contour. So the path up here we call gamma, but the whole entire contour I'm going to call C. Now we're going to notice something in particular that the contour interval over C now is actually going to evaluate to zero because the inside of this contour is holomorphic. So I did a video on that, that's called she's integral theorem. So this is zero. However, we can decompose this path into the integral over gamma and then plus the integral from minus one to one. So what this tells us is that the integral over gamma, which we have over here, is the exact same thing as negative of the integral from minus one to one. And this is something you can do to prove the path independence. So what this gives us finally is the imaginary part of... Now what I'm going to do with this i as well is I'm going to flip it up to the numerator and that just becomes minus i. And then we have the integral, um, negative integral actually. So we have minus i then times negative integral from minus one to one of e to the z dz. And notice these negatives are gonna cancel of course. So this is the imaginary part of i times the integral from minus one to one of e to the z dz. And then we don't really have to use z here, we can just use any variable. Um, this is really quite easy, easy to evaluate. So what is this going to give us in the very end? Well, that's just the imaginary part of i anti-differentiating e to the z that's going to give us once again e to the z and if we evaluate this from minus one up to one and this is the imaginary part of i um, and that's just going to become something like e minus e to the minus one which we can write as one over e and since this guy in here is purely imaginary the imaginary part of that is very quite simple it's just going to become e minus one over e and that is the final result for this integral um so this is a bit of a surprising answer actually because with an integral involving cosines and sines and whatnot you would expect an answer with pi in it just like the last video but this answer only has e's in it which is a bit interesting but yeah that's basically all for this video hope you guys enjoyed this one and up until the next one have a wonderful day and i'll see everyone in the next one bye bye